project and we also talked about Native American issues and we chatted about 10, 15 minutes. We said our goodbyes and just went our separate ways and I just thought he just wanted some attention and maybe some compassion, maybe just that human touch. And people were amazed how that de-escalated so quickly because it really could have had a different outcome. So how does that make me qualified? Well, I think I have a special skill set. I truly care about people and I want to be authentic and compassionate. And for better or for worse, it's who I am. I think it's how I was raised. And of course, you combine that with my personal and professional accomplishments and the life lessons that I've had. But I'm kind, I'm strong, and I'm nurturing. And I've learned that you have to listen, help, and make connections. And you take all of that together, and that's a great foundation to be Rapid City's next mayor. <clears throat> All right, we will move on to a second question. What is your number one priority if you are elected? And we will start with Brad. My number one priority being mayor is, uh, is first public safety. No city will ever re reach its full potential unless its citizens feel that they're safe. And my number one priority is, is, is to make sure that uh, we're taking care of them. <clears throat> Sorry, I should not be taking notes. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I just feel that the number one, as I said before, is, is, um, is public safety. And um, I need to get my my uh, self together here. Sorry. Go ahead. Where, how you uh, Ron, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> my number one priority is you, the citizens of Rapid City, the people that live here, the people that call it their home. We've had a surge of people that have come to our community. And with that surge and that growth, we've, we've seen the, the cracks in our infrastructure, uh, the spike in crime, the houselessness, the prices of homes, taxation, all these things. Uh, uh, lack of transparency in the community, a lack of getting ahead of quality infrastructure and those types of things. So it's really an overall picture of what's happening in our community now. And that's what led me to run for mayor in the first place was the opportunity to bring in real leadership, get the hands back on the steering wheel, get the, road, the car back on the road and head down the right direction. We, got to, we have to, immediately we have to address the crime. We have to address uh, the uh, lack of housing in our, our community. That came from uh, supply and demand. The demand was way higher than the supply, so we find ourselves in a higher price rate market. We find ourselves trying to get through the red tape to get developments off the ground to get a good quality development in a community type development with green spaces and those types of things, we are gonna to have to participate. It's gonna to have to take someone with me that understands how that gets done. Somebody that can work with everybody in the community, somebody that can work with the, the employees, and somebody that can work with the development community and bring quality communities to our city. Get the panhandling under control and work with the people, find out which ones that are, that need help, we can get them help. The ones that don't want help, we'll treat them differently. Get the crime under control, the repeat offenders. We're gonna start putting some of the repeat offenders in jail to give them moments of clarity to find out if they want help or if they wanna to continue to be a repeat offender. At least this is what means something to me, is getting the car back, getting the hands back on the steering wheel of the car, getting them back on the road, keep it between the lines. Thank you. Laura, we'll have you go next is taking ownership and direction of our city's growth. Obviously, we have increased crime and homelessness, and there's a lack of affordable housing. There's aging infrastructure. 
We have overburdened and underfunded public schools, but the impact of our city's growth and being, having poorly planned growth makes all of these issues exponentially worse. I've been talking about a growth and development task force. To explain this just a little bit better, it's a professional city-led coalition of local community leaders. We should use the local talent for people that live and work here year round. And these are people that are active and involved and truly invested in our community and not just focused on special interest. It won't cost the taxpayers any money and I think there's three priorities that we need to start with. Infrastructure, downtown businesses, and schools. With infrastructure, obviously water, the landfill, uh, service lines, but we, our city needs to lead the development, right? We wanna partner with our developers and utilize our infrastructure development plan. Focus on infill, not do the urban sprawl, and emphasize on senior and middle-class affordable housing. Also, the downtown businesses. We wanna reduce the crime, and I wanna bring back the concept of the railroad quiet zone. Partner with Elevate and visit Rapid City so businesses, tourists, and locals feel safe and everyone can enjoy downtown. And lastly, but not least, don't pull that red card. We, how do you have a healthy and vibrant city if you don't have healthy and vibrant schools? We need to partner with our schools and our local universities. And I think it's key that we have mentoring programs and that we continue Mayor Allender's early learner program. And I'll stop right there, thank you. Josh, we'll have you go next. As we all know, homelessness, homelessness and crime is just huge in our city. Um, I got here and it wasn't, it wasn't that bad in 2020. Um, you know, it's an issue that affects uh, not just the ones who are experiencing it, but our entire community, as we know. We cannot ignore it. We cannot uh, just sweep it under the rug. As mayor, I will enforce the law uh, when it comes to issues like panhandling and loitering, but I will also uh, recognize that we need to do more to crack down. We, we need to create programs to help people that, to get back on their feet, like job training, um, placement programs, mental health, and addiction services, and affordable housing initiatives. We need to work with organizations like Cornerstone Rescue Mission um, with the NDN initiative and Hope, Centers to pr uh, Hope Center to provide resources that support those who need it most. Thank you. And Jason. Thank you for the question. Uh, by the way, thank you all for being here tonight. It's great to see a full house. I will tell you this, I have no higher priority than the safety and security of Rapid City. And that's, you're seeing that as a common theme uh, with the candidates and obviously with this answer. Uh, one, one great predictor of what's a future priority is what your past priorities have been. And for me, uh, public safety has been a high priority. I've championed uh, public safety initiatives for our police and fire from fire station one to a new uh, police precinct. I've championed uh, COVID bonuses for those who served on the front lines. Uh, those are those are impactful. Those are those those have made a difference. And so when I tell you that's a priority for me, it's not just something I said I will do. It's something that I have done. So looking forward, it's a priority because the next mayor needs to commit to enforce the law. Uh, because what I hear from folks all the way around is they are concerned about crime. This community, thousands upon thousands, no matter who you are, or what you look like, you do not want to be the victim of crime. And and that is something we all share. And so we all want to live in a safe place to raise our family. And that is a high priority for me. So we will enforce the law too. We will support those on the front lines as we have done and we will continue to do. Uh, we were recently down 34 police officers, but with the recent changes we made to our recruitment and retention packages, as well as our starting salaries for police officers, we're now down 20. So we're making progress. There's still a lot more room to grow, but I'm excited about the progress that we're making. Uh, also, we need to increase police presence in strategic areas to ensure that kids feel safe. And so wherever there's more crime, 
doesn't matter where it is. I want your kids to feel safe. And so we will make sure that we have great police presence there. And obviously we need more accountability. And that means working with the criminal justice system. The mayor doesn't have authority over the court system or criminal justice system, but needs to be a part of that conversation to make sure that that issue uh, is on the radar of everybody as we move forward. So public safety is the number one priority. And as your mayor, that's what I'll commit to. Thank you. All right, lack of civil discourse has been a major problem in our community, state, and country. How would you establish a norm for civil discourse in our city government and in our city as a whole? Uh, Laura, let's start with you. This question seems to be coming up recently, uh, definitely within the last two weeks. Let me be clear, I don't play partisan politics. I never have, never will. In fact, I chose purple to be my campaign color because I think it symbolizes my bipartisan method of governance. You know, during the last six years, I've reached across partisan lines and I've talked with our council members and I have told them time and time again, how do we expect our citizens to get along if we can't get along ourselves? So I think it's important to lead by example and let me be clear, it's not our job to take orders from divisive politicians that might be self-serving. That's just not how you serve as mayor or frankly at City Hall. You know, that does nothing to help our community. And I feel that our number one priority is to be a public servant. You know, listening to the people of Rapid City and doing what's best for them. Thank you. Okay, Ron, we'll have you go next. <clears throat> Thank you. That's just my glasses. I don't need them. I don't read any notes anyway. I don't bring any notes. I don't prepare ahead of time. I just speak from my heart. And I can tell you that uh, being in the positions I've been over, been in throughout my life, from managing people to uh, managing my own businesses. Divisiveness does no good. And I can tell you one of the reasons I came back to the council the last time was because of the, of the lack of leadership and the divisiveness inside the council. I came back to bring some wisdom back to the council. And that when I decided to run for mayor, it was the same platform that I will have when I am your mayor. I listen to people, I analyze the situation, and we can work together to get things done. Very rarely do I have a, a conversation where we can't come to some sort of a good conclusion if both parties are willing to do that. But it obviously takes two people to come together and, and bring those solutions to the table. That's what I am. I'm a solutions-oriented person. I also understand that there are times when people just are going to not agree with each other, but we can move on with those. One of my uh, platforms is... is when I, when I was a manager, I always liked people to enjoy their job. One of the things that was important for me was that people had fun at their work, but they were also held accountable. And you, and you can do that, and the same thing we can do in the city. And one of, this, one of the uh, opportunities we have in the city is to make City Hall a great place to work and make City Hall a great place for folks like you to do business. And I'm the guy that can get it done. I'm, I'm not here to take this job to, to fool anybody. What you see is what you get. I can get the things done. I love this community. I love the people that have their assets in this community. I love the people that love to call Rapid City their home. And I can work with you. There's hardly nobody that I can't work with to get something resolved. Thank you. All right, next, uh, Josh, I'll have you go. <clears throat> Civil discourse. Well, I think we could see that across our, our the world, not only the world, but our country. And the, the separation between people is so widely and vastly um, prominent that we really need to get everybody and work together. Um, you know, whether it's the minorities, the lower class, middle class, the wealthy, we really need to bring everybody together, and I think the start of that is getting cleaning up our streets and cleaning up the homeless 
and really getting the people that are at a disadvantage back on their feet. No one knows that more than me, um, considering how I grew up in, in, as a, in the government, as a ward of the state, I understand the dysfunction, and, and it didn't just start now. It happened from the day I was put into the system in, in 1987. You know, this is this is really it's not it's it's a problem that we need to harness. The whole reason why I wanted to jump in as mayor because I don't feel that I can be effective as a citizen, and the only way that I can really make a real difference is using my experience through my upbringing, um, and you know, even even my uh, my foster dad, who was the chief probation officer of L.A. County, really showed me what it takes to rehabilitate people and get them back on their feet. Not only that, but my uh, biological mother who grew up in on the welfare system, you know, uh, going after churches and welfare to try to get back on their feet, but nothing really happened because there's a mental illness there and that's what we need to address first, is take care of the lower, the lower and um, lower class and homelessness and the crime, and if we can take care of that, um, I believe the city will follow lead. Thank you. Brad, we'll have you go next. Thank you. Uh, I have the great, I had the great fortune of growing up in Wall, and in my mid to later 20s, I was sat on the city council, and I, I got to witness diplomacy at its best. I got to witness uh, what I guess I'd call, uh, you know, the, the local guys, you know, they, They'd have a uh, spirited debate, uh, and uh, each one, everybody would have an opportunity to state what their, how they felt based upon the facts that they had, and when the vote was taken, that was the vote, and we moved on. Um, I've had to also had the good fortune of being involved in private enterprise, um, where we're there again. We have spirited debate. Everybody gets to voice their opinion. They're heard e equally. Um, and then once the vote's taken, you, you walk out of the room in lockstep and, and you're, um, you know, you move on to the next next bite, or excuse me, the next battle. Um, I would hope to lead as the next mayor by example, uh, making sure that at the council level that everybody ha has, a, has an opportunity to speak, uh, Share their viewpoint, and then once the uh, vote's taken, uh, we move on. I think that's important. Now we just had a uh, an, a, a situation of, of to total uh, divisiveness here in Rapid City with the destruction of the political signs. Uh, that type of behavior, that type of divisiveness, has no place in our city, uh, no place anywhere. And uh, anyway, I. I I, I just feel fortunate that I've had the opportunity uh, in many ways to, to be a part of uh, consensus building and, and coming to conclusions and uh, without it becoming divisive and, and everybody having a respect for, uh, well, we, we may disagree, we have respect the fact that uh, other people have different opinions. Thanks. Thanks for time. All right, uh, Jason. One of the things I love about Rapid City is that you can tell a lot about us when times get tough. I wasn't here during the 72 flood, but I've seen the results of people coming together and rebuilding this community. I was here when we almost lost Ellsworth due to the BRAC and I saw our community rally together and, and help save Ellsworth Air Force Base. During Winter Storm Atlas, I saw neighbors helping neighbors because that's what we do. We didn't ask what, if you had an R or D next to your name, you just did it because that's who we are. That is who I believe at the core we are in Rapid City. The problem is in our culture, it's grown more common to dehumanize one another. We look at each other like we are uh, objects, like collective objects versus uh, really individual human beings with value, worth, and potential. And that's wrong. There is a true north. You know, in our Declaration of Independence, we, we, we have this statement that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, what social sphere you come from, what you look like, that you matter just as much as I do. And where do we get that idea? Well, we get that idea from our founding fathers who got that idea from the good Lord who talked about 
we're all created in the image of God. So here's the deal, each and every life matters. That is true north. If you are confused about what true north is, get back on track because that's true north that each and every life matters. You need to know when I do stuff and when I operate, I operate from a true north. Many of you have disagreed with me in this room. We've had respectful conversations. I get that, but we need to get back to what really matters. And I'll say this, um, I think recently in this campaign, it's been a reminder. And I would say I oppose any sort of theft or vandalism or harassment of any kind. That is certainly not who Rapid City is, and we are better than that. Um, Ms. Armstrong shared with me that our mailbox uh, was blown up or something like that. That's, that's awful, and that, that, that should not be. I would ask all of us, let's treat each other. Let's have disagreements. It's okay to disagree, but let's do it agreeably and show each other grace. Thank you. All right, we will move on to the next question. Water is a vital resource and is becoming a scarce resource. How can we ensure a clean, adequate water supply for the future of Rapid City and the surrounding area? We'll start with Josh. Thank you for the question. Water, to me, is the key of life. Um, we live in a water world. Um, you know, there's a lot of alternatives to fresh water, uh, you know, even growing up on the coast, you know, you'd think you'd be able to filtrate um, salt water, and they do have programs for that, but being out here, we really need to um, manage our water and make sure the water is clean. Um, we do have a lot of uh, resources in terms of, like, the dam and you know, we just need to make sure that our water filtration systems are clean and good for the people as, like I said, it is the key to life. Thank you. Ron. Thank you. There's no doubt that uh, water is a precious resource. Originally went back in, I believe it was like 2007, 2009, somewhere in that time when I first was on the council. I was one of uh, uh, 10, but I was the only new member on the council. But it, it didn't take long to figure out that water rights was an important factor for our community, and clean water was a fa important factor for our community. So we went out to, to claim water rights or work out with the federal government water rights for Pactola. So at that time, at that council that I was a part of, we actually went to the Fed and secured water rights from the water of Pactola. At the same time, we went through the community and in, in outskirts of the community and secured water rights for the, for the future of Rapid City. And that's been roughly uh, 12, 10, 13 years ago, approximately or longer. So we understood back then that we planned ahead. And then there was a point in time when we said, you know what, uh, our infrastructure, our water infrastructure, cleaning infrastructure, was coming to its end of, the, end of its useful life. So what we did is we had to go out into the public with people like you and sell them and the fact that, you know what, your water bills are gonna go up five times the number they were today. Nobody thought we could do it. We talked earlier about building consensus, building unity, that's what we did. We went out into the public, took it upon ourselves to meet with the people and say, hey, your, your water bill is gonna go up five times, but here's why. We're going to build an $80 million project called Jackson Springs. We're going to use reverse osmosis, state of the art. And we knew at that time some of the membranes would fail and we would have to replace them at the tune of a million dollars a piece. Come back around later when I returned to the council and they're looking at, hey, we've got to replace these membranes. I said, yep, that's exactly right. We planned on that. That's what we have to do moving forward. We have to plan and we have to make a commitment to the people in the community and you need somebody like me who understands it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Water is very significant. Obviously, none of us survive without it. I can't even get through this event without some water. Um, you know, there's a lot of great efforts going on to make sure that, that we have adequate water supply for the growth to come. I've talked a lot about healthy growth. One of that is ensuring that we have clean water supply, not just for the population we have, but the population we will have in the area to make sure that all people have access to clean water. So 
one effort that's happening is a pipeline from the Missouri River. And that, that's a significant effort because it, it comes upstream from the Missouri River. A lot of uh, lifts and pumps that have to come along with that. It's very expensive. And I think I would strongly support us encouraging that project to move forward. But I think while that's happening, and that's an important project, we should look at other options. And, you know, I don't know how realistic it is, but could we, could we get water rights to the Belfouche Reservoir? Or could we develop a second reservoir instead of Pactola so that we can have redundancy in our water supply? Are there other factors that we can start to look at to be strategic to say, while we're working on this pipeline, is there any other kind of water sources we could tap into for the region? And that's the deal. We have to work, Rapid City has to work regionally with other government entities. I'm happy to have support from some Pennington County commissioners. I'm happy to have relationships with mayors from neighboring communities. Uh, I believe those sort of relationships in addition with our state legislature and federal government are going to be key because water is a regional issue. I'm happy to help provide water to areas surrounding Ellsworth Air Force Base. That's going to be significant as the B-21 comes in, but it's going to take a whole lot more than that. You need someone with a proven track record who can get people together to go after these gigantic projects because, listen, it's a big vision to say we're going to provide water for the area, but a vision you can accomplish by yourself isn't much of a vision. That's why we have to work together, and I look forward to helping develop a regional strategic plan with water being a major part of our emphasis. Thank you. Laura, I often say Rapid Creek is the lifeblood to our city. Water should never be a partisan issue. In fact, Senator Thune just took a recent stance saying that he wants to protect Rapid Creek because it's a matter of national security due to Ellsworth's close proximity and heavy reliance on healthy, clean water. And it's no secret that I brought forth two water resolutions, but let me be clear. I'm not against mining. I'm against mining in our local watershed. And I've also led the charge for a sustainability coordinator and a grant writer. They are gonna make sure that they are gonna find resources where we can protect our water and keep it clean and safe. When the drastic reduction in water flow occurred last December, I was persistent and kind of vocal to find out what happened, what was the chain of command, and ensured accountability. Think about the impact that that incident had on our local economy, our residents, and tourists, plus, you know, the aquatic species as well. That affected businesses, our residents, and our quality of life. Rather than making a simple phone call, I really dove into that and I talked to local groups and businesses that were directly impacted like, uh, from that incident. Black Hills Fly Fisher, The Fly Shop, Outdoor Adventure Companies, and Visit Rapid City, because I wanted to listen how they were affected. I've also been calling for the city to improve their communication, collaboration, cooperation with the State Bureau of Rec and Game Fish and Parks to ensure that something like this never ever happens again. And as your next mayor, I will continue to advocate, like I always have, protecting our, pra our precious natural resources, but especially our water. Thank you. Brad, you're on. Thank you. When it comes to water, I'm relatively, when it comes to the technical aspects, I'm a relative lay person. I, uh, I would require uh, assistance and guidance of, of somebody that was professionally uh, uh, schooled in, in, in you know, uh, our water supply, you know, but, uh, but as a mayor, I think it's, it, is our, it is our duty to, to tread cautiously. Uh, not do anything that would uh, uh, impact negatively our water systems. I believe w with Jackson Springs, we've done a great job of uh, supplying uh, quality water to the people of Rapid City. I think we need to be proactive in making sure that uh, the watershed does not uh, um, is not compromised. And I also believe the mayor needs to be proactive in in being uh, a part of trying to pipe Missouri City water. Uh, to Rapid City for, for, uh, for our future. Um, 
And there might be uh, options otherwise. You know, we have a we have a comp business in town called Respect that works for uh, cities all over the United States. Uh, they work glo globally that uh, work on uh, storage underground storage facilities that we, maybe we might be able to actually uh, uh, store and uh, more water. You know, excess water that becomes available. So I, I think that there's other options to look at and. Um, um, that's it. Thanks. The next question is, large numbers of children live in poverty in Rapid City. Many of them live in North Rapid City where the rate of violent crime is high. Other than increasing police presence, what services would you support to improve struggling communities so children can grow up proud of where they live. Uh, we'll start with Laura. It appears that Rapid City is like a tale of two cities. Most people don't realize a few weeks ago a study came out and it said roughly 52% of all public school children live at or below the poverty line and the majority are in North Rapid. As a community, I find that embarrassing and shameful. But now that we know this information, we all need to do something to improve their lives so we can all improve our entire community. I feel that we need to have a plan, and I have five suggestions for whatever that's worth. I'm a big proponent for community partnerships so we can work to reduce crime together. We hired a violence reduction specialist. In fact, I was on that hiring panel. And with her guidance and resources, I am confident that we can make significant pos uh, positive impacts. Number two, I think we need a grocery store to address the food desert that's in North Rapid. Absolutely. Three build safe and affordable housing units specifically in that area. Four, support community-based social centers for the youth and seniors. We can have such wonderful outcomes from that. We can close the generation gap. We can embrace our different cultures. We can learn from one another by making deep, meaningful, and positive connections. And five, Commit to improving our schools and pilot an early learner program to help increase academic success. By doing so, statistics show that it drastically reduces violent crime. I believe that if we do those five suggestions and take tangible action, I'm confident we will improve our entire community as a whole. Thank you. Uh, Brad. Thank you. I, uh, I think that w what we need to do is, is to continue with a program that exists right now in strengthening the children that go start at kindergarten with er early childhood. Uh, I need to get this over here. Early childhood education. Um, early childhood education. Uh, roughly half of our kids that enter kindergarten uh, don't meet the standards. Uh, they don't know how to uh, write the, the, you know, the numbers. They can't write their name, and they don't know the alphabet. Um, so early childhood uh, education with, with uh, a check, check and balance at kindergarten and then the third grade reading level. Also, food security. I think that uh, um, it's very difficult and I don't know how we'd expect a child to learn if, if they don't know where their next meal's coming from or if they're hungry. Um, other, the other part that I would consider is, is mentoring program, uh, w whether it's mother, you know, the parents, child, or both. And last, I, I believe we need to have mental health services as a component of this. And I believe that investments in these items would, will pay off dividends to us uh, down the road. Thank you. Jason.
Well, I've, I've been one of these kids. I uh, lived in extreme poverty. Uh, before I moved up here at age 11 with my dad and my stepmom who were up here, I, I grew up in West Texas. And uh, many of you know my story, but I, I've been homeless, lived in crack houses, seen and experienced a lot of things that kids shouldn't. My heart breaks for the kids in these neighborhoods that are going through the same thing. And so first and foremost, we need to all admit our kids deserve better. Can we all at least agree with that? I agree with that. Um, you know, the, the, role, the question kind of is what should the government do? Obviously, police presence is significant, and that's an important thing. But I think uh, there's some other things that we should also consider. One is partner with uh, people doing great things in those communities. I'll tell you one, one thing uh, I love is my friend Jacob Weasel. He's currently climbing Mount Everest. And he's a local surgeon. Uh, he is an amazing guy. And one of his goals is to raise money to get new playground equipment for Lakota homes. And you might think that's a little thing, but it's a pretty big thing because if all you have is rundown equipment and everything around you is rundown, you might start to feel like maybe I'm rundown too. Do, am I worth the investment? I would say, yes, you're worth the investment. And so the city can be a part of that, creating park space, perhaps helping with design and implementation. So instead of giving uh, Dr. Weasel uh, roadblocks, let's help them out. Let's make sure that we are doing better. As mayor, also, I would just say this, uh, I believe in the value of strong families. When I moved up here at age 11, it made all the difference for me because I had a mom and dad who loved me. We didn't have much. My dad laid carpet for a living. My mom stayed home, but we had dinner together every night. We lived, they live in the same small house that we lived in. We had love, structure, belonging. I grew and developed. And I cannot even believe that I went from that broken little boy to up here, perhaps being your next mayor. What a story. I don't deserve it. It's all God, it's all grace, and I'm grateful for it. I want that to be the story for the kids in these neighborhoods as well. So I think all of us can rally together for them because they deserve it. Thank you. Josh, we'll have you go next. Thank you. Did you say Ron or Josh? That's right, you'll get your turn, Ron. Okay, I think we all know. <clears throat> uh, it all starts at home. Uh, no, one, no one experienced that more than I did growing up. In, I was in 27 foster homes for a seven, and I was very fortunate enough to see so many different acts of life from, uh, I, I've seen people that are super wealthy and you go in their homes and, and they're just miserable. I've been in the poorest homes and they're just extremely happy. And you know, for the kids, um, it, 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 like I said, it all starts at home. And if you don't have that community support, you need to go to your neighbors. And if you can't go to your neighbors, then you go to your schools because then that gets you out of, out of your home. And that's why it's so important for our school system to be so strong and to actually, for all of us parents, um, mothers and, and fathers, to know what's going on in our school system and what are the after school activities because that's even more important. What do these kids get to go to after school? You know, sports, are we involving them in social activities? And given our schools are what they are today, like, a lot of people are looking to homeschool, and I think homeschool is great considering what we've been facing in the last three years. However, we're missing the social, um, the socializing that we need as children. We need to socialize with other kids and peers of our age, and we need to play sports and we need to play games. I mean, that's what it is to be American to me is you know, to be able to go to school and have fun with your friends and your neighbors, and I will do nothing to, to not support that and to make sure that these children have everything that they need. Thank you so much. Okay, Ron, you get to go now. Oh, thanks, I have to stand up and finish picking up my mess. Here. I appreciate that we all can agree that taking care of our children is of the utmost importance. And I can tell you that, for me being your mayor, that I'm gonna lead by example. I said, uh, years ago we looked at General Beetle School and we looked at what could be, and we made a model example of, a, of an elementary school there. Uh, today was happened to be the day that I would visit my, the mentee that I mentor every Thursday there. And I would call upon every one of you to look inside, look at, look at yourself in the mirror and say, what can you do? 
What can you do to strengthen the community? What can you do to strengthen the youth in the community? Coaching softball, coaching soccer, coaching basketball, just being a good parent, being a good person, taking on some of the, the mentoring capabilities or opportunities they have with the school system. Those are all opportunities that you can do individually. As a government, we can support those. We can support them with the, with the grant writing issues for the 5013 season. We can help them through into the planning and processing stages that will help them be more comfortable moving into those areas. But the most important factor is going to come from what you individually do. There was an old saying called, and I don't know who to give credit for it, but it was each one reach one, each one teach one. That means each one of you can make a difference, an individual difference. And collectively, that difference would be way larger than one individual person could make. But I can tell you, if I had to choose between mentoring that young man, he's a third grader, or being the mayor of your city, I, I definitely would take mentoring that young man because I know someday he's gonna have an opportunity, he's gonna have a chance, he's gonna have hope. Thank you. And just a reminder, we'd like you all to remain seated while you answer questions. Earlier, so I just join in. We speak so much better than we stand. All right, we will move to the next question. Mayor Allender helped create Journey On, One Heart, and the CARE Campus. What is your plan for the continuation of these programs? All right, we'll start with Laura. Okay. I'd like to continue them on, and I, because I believe in these projects because it addresses the social issues that impact our community. We should be supporting mental health, improving mental health, and expanding these facilities. And we simply don't have enough of these resources because this has not been a priority in our state, unfortunately. And now we're seeing the results of ignoring these very real and significant challenges. As a daughter of a retired law enforcement officer, I'm not soft on crime, but I caution those that are calling for less compassion and more accountability to consider the cost to the taxpayer and actual effectiveness of these proposals that they're talking about. When you criminalize homelessness, as suggested on Tuesday's forum, and you try to make camping illegal, it go, people will then have to go to a place and they will be arrested for sleeping outside. And think about it, so they're gonna be issued a citation and they're gonna give a fine that they cannot pay and that's not gonna change any problems with the downtown panhandling. And at what cost? You know, the cost of spending a night in Pennington County Jail is now $95, up $10 from last year. And also consider the burden placed on our law enforcement officers, our judicial system, our uh, jail staff, the city attorney's office, the public defender's office, and they're all of a sudden going to start having 10 or 20 new cases every night. And then consider the cost of the, lo the lost income when we no longer have those cells available for federal inmates. So instead, I think we need to invest more into these programs like Journey On, Care Campus, One Heart, and the Hope Center. And that will provide holistic and realistic solutions in our community. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I have a lot to say about this. Uh, Brad, why don't you go next? Thank you. Uh, in regards to the question, I, I would keep uh, Journey on and in one heart. Um, I, I believe they both need to be expanded. We have we have a more demand for the services than we have services for that. What the reason I didn't mention the care campus is we have a new sheriff and, and our new sheriff and our, our new and our chief of police are working on a new program, and I'm anxious. To, I'm anxious to see what they they come up with, and I, I think they're ready to unveil it soon. And I'm excited, and in in because I think the care campus has has worked, but but not the way they originally wanted it to. Uh, the other I, the other new program that I, I'm really high on is what's called Mobile Medic. I had a chance to go out and do a ride along, about a three hour ride along, a couple of weeks ago with the Mobile Medic. 
And that is that is uh, just what it sounds like. It's a paramedic and a Florida Explorer um, that uh, that travels the streets and, and takes care of uh, non non emergency, non ambulatory uh, type uh, medical issues. Uh, it, it saves greatly on 911 calls. If somebody dials 911 now, as you know. Uh, an ambulance shows up and uh, usually a fire truck with 750 p gallons of uh, water. We don't need that. Somebody just needs some medical attention. Uh, they might need a Band-Aid or they might need some salve. And that's what Mobile Medic does. And, and I know we, I'm guilty of throwing numbers around, but I've heard that, you know, in a year it could save the city up to, you know, a million, million and a half bucks. So I think they're great programs. Hopefully we can come up with, with more to, to, to better serve the needs of the less fortunate uh, but uh, but I think one heart and journey on are, are, are super thanks Ron I'll have you go next thank you I promise I try not to stand up <laughs> but mobile medic one heart journey on all great programs they were built on the concept of compassion and accountability. There's no doubt about that. You cannot have one without having the other. Otherwise, people will continue to wander aimlessly without the help they need to get. SB 70 passed in like 2017 was a state legislation law that was passed that was to reduce crime in certain areas. But they, in doing that, the noble cause was, yep, we're going to bring probation officers to you. We're going to bring parole officers to you and then we're going to bring mental health and addictive health facilities to you and as sure as we're all sitting here and i'm not standing they didn't happen it didn't happen it's got to happen it, the, the, to think that you can have com a compassion with no accountability just keeps perpetuating the problem that we're in we, we can't do that anymore being the mayor of Rapid City requires somebody with the fortitude to stand on the governor's desk and say, you know what, we're not going to put up with that anymore. We're the second largest city in the state of South Dakota. If you're going to make us a promise, you're going to follow through with it, and I'm going to make darn sure it happens. Yeah, we are. We, there is a new sheriff in town, and we're changing things because we can't have young men in our community getting killed on a regular basis. We can't have that anymore. It's unacceptable. We all talk about it and we all pander to whatever people want to hear. I'm not going to pander to what anybody wants to hear. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is we need accountability combined with the compassion asset. But we also need what they promised us they were going to do. You can't just let these people float around in, in perpetuity. I'm sorry, I'm time's up, and I, but I did sit down, so thank you. Thank you, and uh, you know these are these are programs designed to help, and I, I think some of them probably are better than others. But uh, I, I do first want to give credit to Journey On. So far, that has been a very productive program for Rapid City. It's it saved us money and saved us uh, transportation and provided services. And you know, with all due respect to Mayor Allender, I give credit to our council president Lance Lehman for a lot of his work on that. I, I he's he's the one who really helped bring that forward, and uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, it's always good to give credit where it's, where it's due. So here's the thing is, if everything we're doing for homelessness is working so well, how come it's not working so well? And I think that's the question we have to ask is when we're looking at organizations to support, we need to start asking ourselves, hey, which ones are doing it well and which ones are not? And those who are doing it well, we need to direct our dollars there. In particular, those of us who are donors and those of us who uh, offer volunteer and support you give to those organizations. So, so far we're seeing great things from Journey On. I think One Heart has been good. Cornerstone is the overnight shelter. And you can tell that an organization matters that what you asked this question, what would happen if they left? And Cornerstone, whether you like them or not, they serve a critical function in our community. The thing is, how can we better invest in those areas and help them do their job even better? with addition to one heart and with addition to other things. So I'm gonna say this, I think this is, you can have compassion and you can have common sense. So here's the deal, the homeless 
should be in shelters, those who are truly, truly homeless. Those who are, have serious mental illness should be in treatment. Those who battle addiction should be in rehab. Those who commit crime should go to jail. And your relatives should be taken care of by you. If my family who's sitting here today that fall on hard times, and I've had some fall on hard times, they need to know that I would be there for them because that's what you do. So those are, those are easy to say. They're harder to implement because it costs money. It's going to take all of us coming together from the state on down to make that a reality. Thank you. I'm out of time. Josh. Thank you for the question. Um, so Campus Care, Hope Center, One Heart, Journey On. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know the effect in effectiveness of all these programs what I do know is that um, my mother took advantage of a lot of programs like this and that we need to take uh, insight to that and see what's really you got to look at it from both sides of the equation the people accepting the the help and the people that are trying to enforce it and trying to actually help the people and what we have is we need um, we need accountability um, with these programs and I think we need more programs uh, you know to really be able to see a program that's effective you know you need to get out there and be firsthand and see it from both sides of the angle to be able to know what's working and what's not working you know our, our community is definitely struggling uh, I think a lot of it had to do with the COVID and the inability to be able to address issues such as the native homeless ish issue which is you know I, I saw on last Sunday it was the first sunny day that came out and there's there's a difference between the natives that work here and they're part of our communities and the natives that come out from the reservation and their sole goal is to hang out and panhandle and get drunk and these are these are actions that are completely unacceptable. And I know, and I know, and I know, I know that's that's uh, you know somebody. No one wants to talk about it, but it's a real I issue. To stop from the audience. You. Uh, yeah, I have no racism, buddy. My first girlfriend was a Chumash Indian. Thank you. Let's. Uh, Doubt it. Let's calm down, please. Don't make me use my mom voice. Ask my kids. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have one last question, and that is, the mayoral office is nonpartisan. As mayor, how will you maintain a position of neutrality in resolving politically divisive issues? And we will start with Ron. Thank you. And it is a nonpartisan race, but uh, as we campaign, people ask you all the time, what's your political affiliation or whatever, and I'm comfortable with that because that is part of uh, the American process. But typically, I have no, no issues with uh, partisan politics. It, it's simple. You listen to the facts. You gather data. It's something that our city is not really good at is gathering data and, and finding metrics and finding accountability to where they stand. So I think that's the easiest way to make a factual decision is, is having the information available, you, gathering data. You talk about homeless people. How many homeless people do we have? Why are they homeless? What are their issues? These types of things. If you have the facts on all this stuff, it's a lot easier to make a strong and correct and positive decision. And that's one of the areas that I plan on making better. And the tra uh, transparency. Uh, bringing everybody here into the process saying, you know, how to how, give me the information and make it available to me as a person. Make it readily available to me. What are you doing in City Hall? This helps divide the, the political division because the city hall is nonpartisan because we have to represent, what we do is represent Democrats, Republicans, Independents, non-affiliateds. We even represent the people that don't vote. That's important, and that's important for anybody in this position to understand. And it's important for the people that are voting to understand. You know, we, we appreciate you that you vote. It takes a lot of work to get to, get into this position for, for this job. And we appreciate working for you. But that's what the key is, working for the people in the community, whether they vote or don't vote, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or whatever their affiliation is. So it, it's, an easy, it's an easy situation to handle. Thank you. Brad, we'll have you go next. 
Thank you. I, I view, I guess my answer is going to be mostly about the, uh, making business decisions on, on behalf of the city. Uh, I grew up in, in uh, closely held family businesses uh, where we uh, we sit down, we, we discuss, we, we may try to make the best decisions uh, that we can with, with the information that we have. And, uh, and the best business decision is just that. It's the best business decision. And, you, and we don't sit down and uh, talk about our political views. Uh, to see if, if that business decision checks or not. And that's the same way with the city. Um, we have an obligation to serve everyone. We have the obligation to sit down, look at the facts, uh, uh, develop our opinions, and try to come up with the best possible decision that, that uh, impacts the people that are, it's supposed to impact and uh, have the most positive impact on, on the most amount of people. And again, whatever comes boils down to the best, the best decision is just that. It's the best decision, and don't get caught up in uh, politics. I am, um, I, I'm glad this is a nonpartisan position, and and uh, look forward to serving everybody. Um, so, anyway, that's that's where I see this. Laura, I feel partisan politics have no place in municipal government. I build bridges, I heal divides, I inspire people, and I bring people together. I don't care what their politics are. I'm known at City Hall and in the community as being a unifier. Not if I'm just bringing a, a resolution forward or if I'm participating in uh, com community improvement projects. You know, long before campaign season, I was active and involved in the PTA and at the Humane Society and the library. I didn't care what people's politics were. I was just happy that I was socializing with my neighbors. You know, and now more recently, I'm doing community murals in North Rapid, ADA picnics, uh, addressing racial relations, learning, and also helping our youth city council and I've encouraged other city council members and community members to get active and involved too. We have to lead by example. You know, just this year in February, I uh, brought together a strategic plan forum. We didn't care about our politics. We were sharing our goals and figuring out ways how to get there. Tonight, when we come together, um, we're, we're doing a product drive that's we don't care about politics and that we want to help our community i firmly believe is how you campaign is how you serve so i signed a public pledge just this week saying i will not participate in dirty politics this is what i do and this is who i am this is how i've served the last six years on council and this is how i'm going to serve as your next mayor thank you Jason. Excuse me. Well, I think one of the greatest challenges we have today is a lack of trust. And when you have a lack of trust, it's really hard to get things done. Uh, quite frankly, the position is nonpartisan, but the people are not. And that's just me being straight up and honest with you, that we all come up here with a certain philosophy and experiences and values that guide our decision making. And I think it's fair to you to answer your questions about what we believe in. I think it's okay to talk about it, to be open and honest. You know, I talk about my values of being God, family, country, and rapid city. I share that with you, not to shove it down your throat, I promise you. I share it with you so you at least know my starting point. You know where I'm coming from. Because from there, and when I know it's, what's important to you, we might be able to find common ground. In this day and age, we need to know when to stand our ground, but you also have to know when to seek common ground. And I've often seen that we will stand our ground, but we won't seek common ground and we fight each other. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, we, will seek common, or we will seek common ground, but we have no ground that we actually stand on, so it's whatever. And so when you talk about neutrality, I'll say this, when you're making decisions for the city, I think you have to do your best to be fair and objective to everybody. You serve the entire city. But I will also say that neutrality, I think is a myth. I don't think you can always be neutral and you have to be honest about that. That if you're gonna ask if I'm gonna be fair to and be neutral to every divisive issue, I can't say that. 
that will depend. There are some issues that if, you, for example, if you're seeking to harm children, you're gonna run up against a brick wall with me. I'm not seeking common ground, I'm stopping you. But there are other issues that we can seek common ground on and we can fight for. And I think those are the kinds of things that we should look at. So let's build trust with each other. Let's just be honest about who we are. That's okay, we know where we live. But from there, we can start a conversation about the things that we do agree on. Because I think there's a lot that we can agree on to make this place the best place possible, not just for us, but for the next generation. Thank you. And Josh. <clears throat> Um, serving everybody equally, I mean, that's that's the sole purpose, I believe, of a government position, is to not um, see red versus blue or white versus black or any, any non-bipartisan position. Obviously, um, you know, we need to treat everybody equally and come together as a community. And whether it's business, you know, um, where my where I fall short is people uh, when they when they're not being a part of the community when they're not actually putting in their part of the community and just kind of want to hang out and and not you know serve the community and you know go get a job at least put in the effort to go get a job you may be on welfare but I want you to go and try to get a job you know you may be homeless but I want you to go and try to get a job and support yourself and support the people next to you. I mean, there's no, there's no difference in like when you say um, serving everybody equally. Well, would that imply that everybody's working equally? Are we all coming together as a community? Are we supporting our neighbor? Those are things that we all need to take it to, in consideration as a community, because there's no one versus the other. Let's come together as a community and work together as a community. Thank you. All right, that ends our section of uh, the questions that the candidates received. We will now, ha we do have some time. Uh, a couple of our candidates have a little bit of a time constraint, so we do have some time, though, for questions from the audience. I have some written on cards. Otherwise, you can come down, and I'll, I'll let you use my microphone to ask your question. So. Stand. This is in regards to the question about water and the expense of bringing water from the Missouri River and looking at the reservoirs. What I didn't hear from any of you was water conservation or any things to put in place in terms of all the rapid growth in apartment buildings to decrease the amount of water. Um, a lot of communities are looking at low flow toilets. They're looking at zero scaping for landscaping to reduce water costs. Um, so I would like to hear from each of you exactly how you look at water conservation as opposed to spending more money on bringing more water in. And in the interest of time, we're only allowing one minute for answers to these questions. All right, uh, who would like to go first? Brad? Sure, I think that's a great question. And, and I, I, think, uh, I think what we need to do is take a look at our landscape uh, ordinances and, and adjust to, to try to make the, our yards so that they, they use less water. Um, and I th think that's a great idea, and uh, I appreciate the question. Thank you. I, I, the, the city has had some energy efficient uh, rebates available. I'm not sure if they still are, but we can continue looking at for low flow uh, wash machines, washers, any low flow appliances and stuff. They do have rebates available. They had a money available. I'm not sure if it still exists, but also talking about uh, zero scaping is an important thing moving forward about finding ways to, you know, we have boulevards and they're just almost impossible so why don't we look at looking at different ways to zero escape with rocks or whatever we have to do so that's a great question so i think that can be worked into our plan and we just we just have to put it in a plan and we just have to do it that's the most important thing is to do it thank you laura um 
I did mention it. At the Growth and Development Task Force, when I mentioned infrastructure, water was the very first thing that I mentioned because I think it is critical. As I said, it's the lifeblood for Rapid City. I think, uh, oh, when I, I went to a water forum about six months ago, and they were talking about bringing the water from the Missouri over. This will be a multi-billion dollar project. We'll never see it in our, in our lifetime. But my main question was, Oh, what was my main question? Oh, why don't we take care of the Rapid Creek? Shouldn't that be our emphasis? So I think that we, that leaders lead, and we should be doing this at City Hall. Uh, we have an amazing sustainability uh, committee. We now have a, an amazing, uh, we're going to have a, a sustainability coordinator, and I think that we just need to model this at City Hall with green roofs and low flow toilets and whatever else we can be directed to do because that's not my wheelhouse, but leaders lead and we need to do this at City Hall. Thank you. All right. We'll do uh, one more question from the audience and then we'll do. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I did not do that on purpose. <laughs> And yesterday, I'm okay with conserving water, jeepers. Uh, uh, but seriously, I think for me, uh, it will boil it down to listening to our to the people that work in our water department. If they if they talk about conservation, I think there are things that that we certainly can do. We know that we all alternate days for watering lawns and and so forth. I do think we have to be careful on the discussion, because housing is in, is increasing in cost, and if we add too much burden, it might actually increase the cost of housing. And so the great Thomas Sowell, who's a great economist, says there are no solutions, only trade-offs. So when you look to conserve water, the, the other end of the question I would just ask, and I don't know for sure, but I would just say, is requiring all these other things to conserve water going to price people out of their homes or make it more people live in poverty? I mean, these are these are all things to ask. And But at the same time, obviously, we're going to do everything we can to protect our water. But I just say when you're evaluating those things, I would listen to our experts. I would ask questions to say what would be the trade-off here, and then we would go from there. Thank you. Josh. Thank you for the question. Um, I actually had a friend of mine come all the way fly out from Perth, Australia, that happens to be uh, water uh, treatment and conservation. Um, I mean, that's what he does for a living. And w what we really need to do is just bring in the professionals and like analyze and see what's going on with our water. Obviously, it is the key to life. Um, pure water is important to us all. And we need to uh, consult with professionals about that. Thank you. Now we will go for another question. <laughs> one of the written questions and then we'll get to some of yours as well. Do you think Rapid City is accessible? How would you plan to increase accessibility for those who are disabled? It didn't say that, I just added it to the question. Go ahead, yes. No, I think we have a long way to go. Um, one in four people will be disabled at some point. And it's, it's one of those things I've, by the way, this is something I've learned as I've been on council. I can't tell you that six or seven years ago, seven years ago when I first started council, that I really fully understood. But as I've made friends with people who um, need different kinds of levels of accessibility, as I've seen uh, family members struggle, uh, I helped a friend uh, get into her car and she tried to open her car door. She had a wheelchair. We couldn't open the door wide enough so that we can get her in from because you need it you need accessibility just to get a wheelchair over there so that she could get into the car so stuff like that I've experienced over time and I think that's something that out of compassion that we should that we should look at obviously there's great expense to that I understand but I think one thing we've done as we've continued to look at planning and zoning is we've said hey is there are there things that we can just build homes that are accessible to everybody it can can we Think about just you know wider door frames or those sort of things. So there's a lot to be done. I think we have more work to do and I'm out of time. Thank you. All right, who would like to go next? Ron? You, the city does have a, uh, a, a committee that has uh, 
for disabilities. So it's important that if you haven't experienced it yourself is to, to spend some time with a cane or a walker or a wheelchair and drive and, and go around town and, and feel for yourself where there's opportunity to be more accessible. So listening to those people and actually making these things happen are two different things. But just if I find that if you could if you can feel some empathy or put yourself in someone else's position, you, you're light years ahead of where you may be being a normal person who doesn't have any uh, disabilities. So if you're a person with disabilities, you look at the world with a different perspective and you find different ways to compensate. So if you put yourself into those shoes, that'll help a ton. And that's what we're going to do a lot of. But I wanted to go back to the water thing for one thing. I want people to know in here that we have a big issue with water leaking in our community that the city is aware of and they've found it to be an acceptable level, which is unacceptable to me. So whoever was bringing up that water question, if you ever want to have a conversation about that, I'll have that with you. Thank you. All right, we will continue with the accessibility issue. Brad, do you want to go next? Well, I think, uh, you know, as we improve and update and renew our cities or our, our streets and our intersections and stuff, we, we're constantly updating uh, accessibility in the city. It's just that uh, we're not doing it fast enough. Uh, it, it comes down to, the, to uh, what's available in the CIP. But uh, it's it, you know it's unacceptable for us not to not to not to be active, proactive in, in making sure that uh, we we improve accessibility in the city. All right, who has not gone? Uh, Laura or Josh, you want to go? Go ahead. Sorry. 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 Sure. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, access accessibility. I mean, obviously, we all love our grandmothers and our grandparents. Um, for me, I just grew up as a gentleman where if my grandma had problems with accessibility, I would be right there for her. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see, you know, going around town, I don't, I don't see there's a lot of um, limitations to that unless you're in a second or third story um, loft downtown. Uh, I mean, you know, is, is it an issue in our bathrooms? I, I don't really see an issue there, so thank you. Laura. As a speech language pathologist that works with people with traumatic brain injuries, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and I assure you, it is an issue in our city. We need to expand our public transportation to help people with mobility issues, as well as our seniors. Um, we have a very antiquated public transportation system that needs to be expanded. And thankfully, I have uh, been a part of what we now call the Disability and Accessibility Committee, which is the former Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities. And they are actively um, engaged and within our community looking for places where we can expand and do better in our services. And once again, that is why I pushed for a sustainability coordinator and a grant writer, because together they can help get us the funds, the direction, and the resources to help everybody in our community. Thank you. All right, we'll have a question from. Uh, thanks, Susan. I'd like to follow up on the question that Susan asked with regard to the, the uh, poverty in South Dakota. Uh, and Mr. Weifenbach indicated that everybody needs facts. I would suggest you all reach out to Vukurovich because they have broken it down to Pennington County and Rapid City. In that particular case, it says that 37% of single mothers in Rapid City live under the poverty level. It says that 24.4% of our children live in the poverty level. They also focused on housing. The average income, median income for a single mother in Rapid City is $24,000. When you look at the cost of housing and talk about the need for affordable housing, how are you going to approach two things? Raising those salaries for those single moms because over 70% of them are currently 
working according to this study? And secondly, how are you going to provide housing for them? Thank you. <laughs> Do the best you can. Thank you for, thank you for that question. Well, he, uh, oh, okay, go I'm just going yeah, to go down the line. I'm just going to go down the line. Okay, that's fine. Well, Let's as you look at what what the components are to, to develop land, to develop housing, you've got land acquisition, site development, build the house. You got to have a loan program that fits the needs of the customer. So the bottom line is is you need to have government participation on the on the lot development side because on the on the build the house side, um, there's so many fixed costs. People, you know, the price of lumber doesn't change whether it's a luxury home or a, or a or a, 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 a an affordable housing unit, so so the only place you can do that, and and we have the ability to do, be involved in that is is hopefully uh, use land that that's an infill project. Uh, we can we can develop it with using TIF financing or something like that, and and then there's going to have to be some kind of a development corporation that allows those lots to to go to the party. At a reduced cost, and then you, you take the, that, that price difference and you, you create a second mortgage on the backside. It, it's going to take government and, and uh, participation to make it work. All right, Ron. We sure? Okay. We're sure. All right, thanks. No, I, I appreciate the facts, and I, I can tell you that there's definitely going to have to be a level of government government participation. When it comes to somebody making $24,000 a year, pretty much a home is unaffordable for them. So there's going to have to be like a Section 8 subsidy or something like that that, that brings them into an affordable position. I do have some rentals at my, the, uh, myself, and one thing I can tell you, is the government talks out of both sides of their mouth when they talk about affordable housing. If you are a non-owner occupied house, you pay 25% more right off the top in property tax than anybody else that actually owns their house for one thing. So when they talk about the affordable housing issues like that, they're, 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 they're kind of skirting their own issues about raising the cost for a renter to have a house. But also, you have to have the government participation in the fact that when you are building the infrastructure, if you want to have quality infrastructure, water, sewer, and roads, the city of Rapid City will have to participate. And I have a plan. I don't have enough time in a minute to tell you that, but that's a reality for. And I also am working on bringing jobs to Rapid City that pay $80,000 a year and you don't need a college degree. So thank you. All right. Who would like to go next? Josh. So affordable housing um, and rising salaries. Um, for affordable housing, I'm thinking that we're talking about single parents. So I propose to start a program for single parents to help them with childcare because I realize as a single parent, regardless what side of the uh, spectrum you're on, that you need assistance because if you're going to work to maybe make $150 a day if you're at 24000 a year, maybe $125 a day, and you have to spend, what, um, 60 to $40 a day on just to go to work for your child care. So I think that's that's a big, um, that's a big issue there. Um, in terms of affordable housing, I think you need to uh, calculate how many low-income um, people are out there, <clears throat> excuse me, and then be able to uh, adequately divide like what 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 cost do we need for affordable housing do we need to pick it up you know uh, how do we how do we divide it so uh, to me it's kind of a math equation thank you all right next laura or jason try to get this done in one minute ready set Go. Okay. All right. I think child care and elder care, as well as affordable housing, take the main chunk of people's salaries. So I think as a government, we can't tell businesses what they have to pay, uh, our local, uh, what they have to pay, but we can work with businesses and elevate to recruit good paying jobs for people so they can afford to live. As for affordable housing, I've already been working with Common Bond. I talk with ha Habitat for Humanity. Again, I'm going to go back to that growth and development plan because affordable housing in, is in there and that is critical infrastructure as well. 
So that's all I can really say in one minute. There we go. All right. 1.9% unemployment rate. That sounds great, it's terrible. It means we, we don't have enough workers for the jobs that we have. Single moms, what an amazing workforce opportunity that we have. So one thing we can do is we could partner with our next uh, vocational schools and universities to help upskill those single moms so that they have a chance to get a higher paying job. And one of the things they can also do, and I think it's been a great point brought up here today, is that a childcare component while they're going to school and that they can upskill, get a, get a career perhaps in nursing like my wife and have a have a great life and build go on from there now on to housing very quickly oh man the property taxes are hurting us really bad and if you don't think it impacts those who pay rent it does because it always flows downhill I call on the state legislature to put a cap and do something about the unnecessary unreasonable increases to our property taxes we get it has to go up a little bit incrementally but my goodness this uh, 20 30% business is taxing people out of their homes. That hurts affordability more than anything else. Thank you. All right. Did everyone get to answer that question? Yes. Okay. We'll have one. From uh, good evening. Uh, so for, for those of us in this community that don't feel more safe by increased police presence, what would any one of you uh, as mayor do to decrease the violence inflict inflicted on the Native American community by the police in Rapid City? Thank you. Laura. I think it starts with um, making those connections that I was talking about. Um, if this is your community, I want to know what your solutions are. I want to hear the stories that impact you. I don't want to just read it uh, on, on the internet. I want to hear personal stories. I think sitting in circles and learning about people and having empathy and understanding help do that. If we together can, can come together and figure out a solution that is guided by our communities, I think it will be much more receptive we don't have to uh, put more uh, law enforcement presence there and partner with our, our neighbors and help us figure out the problems that are going on. I think we need to be community guided and we need your help in understanding that. I think everybody wants to reduce crime and I think we just need to invest more in our, our youth and our communities and embrace our similarities thank you brad the native american population has been a part of the fabric of this community for forever um and as uh, as my my last two years on the city council's president i i was um it was considered a consensus builder and i guess i i got that tag by by doing one thing and one thing well and that's listening and I guess that's that's what I see we have to do. We have to sit down and we have to listen to each other and, and, and we have to uh, understand each other's uh, concerns and problems and then hopefully we can start to build something uh, substantial that uh, is meeting and um, serves both parties well. Ron, you're on next. Thank you. And I I appreciate that because I, I've learned over the years of uh, working with, in different environments and working with different people of different cultures, I found the one, one of the most important things, obviously, is to understand the cultures of the people that you're dealing with because people have different ways or different perceptions at looking at something. Some may say, you know, they love the police, they're not afraid of them. Some may be afraid of them for whatever reason. It may be a cultural barrier. It may be an influence that took, took place somewhere in their, in their life. But if you sit down and you listen, and everybody, it can't be just a one-sided conversation. It has to be two-sided conversations, and there has to be room for ignorance. Because there's, there's things that I've found out, even in the last few years, uh, in reference even to the Native culture about sun dances and those types of things and the spirituality that it brings but the overall feeling that it gives the people and to see 
and understand the culture of another person makes it really much harder to misinterpret what they're saying. So bringing the people together, building those bridges is what's going to be important moving forward. But we need everybody to have a seat at the table to be honest with each other. Thank you. Either one. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it all comes down to questions, getting involved with the community, um, you know, going out there and, you know, um, speaking with uh, the Native community and say, what, what are your struggles? What, what's going on? How did you get to where we are today? You know, I grew up in St. Inez Valley. We have the Chumash Indians. Um, and I grew up with them in school. Uh, one of my first girlfriends was uh, almost 100% um, Chumash Indian. And we didn't have that problem where we grew up. You know, they were all very prominent, went to school, had jobs, the same, same sort of thing. So I think this is a community issue that we all need to come together and figure out together. Because it's, it's not about Native American, white and black, or red versus blue. This is a community problem. We need to come together as a community to figure it out. And what that comes down to is questions. We've got to ask the questions. How did we get here? How do we overcome, how do we overcome this? And how are we going to move forward? Thank you. Well, I'm not Native American, and I won't pretend to under fully understand your experience. And I will say this. I do know that we need to respect one another. I believe in equal justice under the law. And I believe that our police department is made up of excellent men and women. And I am sure that we have room to grow. But I stand behind our police department as I stand behind the rest of our community coming together. Um, I actually believe that I would love to see more Native Americans within our law enforcement agency. And I love, I love when, I, when I see more people involved and engaged and working together because I, I believe our police department really genuinely do care. Uh, we have a great police chief. We have a great sheriff. I believe they, they're willing uh, to do the right thing. And I believe they're very respectful. and. Um, and the quality people that serve our community is outstanding. So I'm sure there's work to do. I know there's work to do. And I won't pretend to understand everything. But I think it begins by showing respect to one another. Thank you. All right. This is a written question. Uh, just yesterday, the governor was in the area to promote South Dakota tourism and the investment of recently allocated state funds to help achieve tourism goals. What would you do or what would be your approach to further enhance the ongoing efforts to preserve history and the cultural arts in our community? I ask this because historic preservation along with eco and agritourism is important in forming the basis of our state's second largest industry that is so vital to economic development. This was submitted by Historic Rapid City. What would you do as a mayor, or what would be your approach to further enhance the ongoing efforts to preserve history and the cultural arts in our community? Who wants to start? Brad. One minute. One minute? Well, you got to say ready, set, go once, okay. so. Well, if you look at the general fund budget and you look at it's about $80 million and you look at uh, that 46% uh, of our general fund income is from sales tax, we know that that uh, doing anything, uh, I mean, we have to do what, we have to keep that sales tax ball rolling. Um, otherwise, we, we have to rely more on property taxes. So uh, anything we can do to uh, market our community, uh, make it more worthwhile for, for visitors while they're here to, to look at our history and our rich, you know, the, the cool buildings we have and the money that's been spent on rehabilitating them. Uh, you know, I th that all adds to the quality of experience our visitors have when they come to Rapid City. Um, I, you know, my personally, I've, I've, we've just purchased and redid the freight house and, and we hope that, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, visually uh, an improvement for the community and uh, for an old railroad property. So um, anyway, I think I think the historic preservation is, is plays a huge part. Thanks. Uh, 
Laura? And up again, but I won't, I promise you. Uh, this is one of the soapboxes I've been on for a while. The arts and the culture in our community are under, under deserved or under uh, utilized. I'm saying they bring a lot of people to our community, but yet they receive nothing. Every year when I sat on the council and they'd come in front of us and beg for a little bit of funding here, a little bit of funding there, and I would pull, I would pull the arts people up side and say hey let's start a coalition let's go after some of this money the civic center gets they're getting over four million dollars uh they're getting over a million million and a half to promote rapid city the civic center is getting four million of it people love the arts and culture when you go somewhere else another community went to new zealand see the moais go to uh anywhere go to europe and see the you see the big buildings you see all these things these are huge people come to rapid city to see our arts and culture but yet they never share in the spoils of the sales tax and the uh, the bed and booze tax or the BB tax. We have to go to the state and change the law, but we need the players to make this happen. Thank you. Well, arts and culture, um, I think it's a lot of supported by our tourism. I think that's what actually attracts half of our tourism, which we all know is a huge part of the community support. I mean, we have pretty rough winters every, every winter, especially this one. Um, and I believe that, you know, uh, taxing um, tourists at a moderate rate to really support our um, our arts and cultures, as that is a huge part of our community. Thank you. Jason. Well, I think that there's, we have history worth preserving. I think we have a great story to tell here in Rapid City. Uh, some of it uh, not as good as others, but I think the story of Rapid City is one that we have a pioneering spirit and that it's possible here. And so I think if you were to look at preservation or anything of that nature, I know that there's efforts to bring an archive center to this uh, area. We, we have room here at the Journey Museum, but I'm told that the room is, is running out of space. Um, so I know that there's an effort for that. That might be a good place to tell a story. I often think about how we can further use the monument to perhaps tell the story of Rapid City. Uh, from the time before uh, it was settled with our Native American community and obviously with Hay Camp and everything that's gone on since then. I think the monument uh, has is, is a blank canvas in order to tell the story of Rapid City and perhaps even share some of the memorabilia and unique things about our community that make it special so that when visitors come to visit us, it's right there already ready at the monument to tell the great story of Rapid City. Thank you. I'm a firm proponent for arts culture and historic preservation and I feel that they are uh, significantly underfunded and that's one of the reasons why I brought forward a grant writer because we need to invest in this. It's not just about tourists, it's about the people that live here as well. When's the last time that you came here besides this forum? We can't just rely on the tourists to pour money into this. We show respect and we honor the things that are in here when we come here and and visit the Journey Museum. In addition, um, there's the shoebox project. There are lots and lots of local collectors. Where, where are these artifacts going to go? And are we as a community going to understand that investing in history and preserving that, it must be on our radar because it defines who we are, who we were, and where we're going. So. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Have you all weighed in on this one? I stopped keeping track. <laughs> all right. Hi. Thank you. This is a two-part question. <clears throat> um, I guess first off, do you believe, and will you admit that, or do you believe that racism exists within Rapid City? And second part is going to be, what measures will you take to address the root causes of uh, systematic racism in our city? Laura? Yes, racism does exist. We know that. We see examples of it, um, but you don't tolerate it. If you see something, you say something. When the Grand Gateway issue happened, 
I went to City Hall. I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to say? I was told, don't worry, it'll blow over. That was unacceptable. I went out and wrote an op-ed. Power of the pen, I guess. That's what I can do. Everybody's got to do their part to call out racism. As a mayor, again, leaders lead. When you are at City Hall, you do not tolerate racism. We have our Human Relations Commission, which now is called our Community Relations Commission. That plays a part. Going into the communities, sitting down and listening, not talking to, but listening to the people. Again, hearing their stories will give us an understanding of how we can navigate racism together in Rapid City. It has no place in here. Thank you. All right, next speaker, Josh. Oh boy, I'm gonna get a hard time for this. Um, I don't see racism in like, I, I don't see difference in color or anything. What I see is a difference in, in people that are a part of the community and the people that aren't a part of the community. To me, um, you know, natives alike and or white people, black people, there are people that are either putting in their work, going out and getting a job and paying their taxes and paying their rent and going out and actually being a part of the community. And there are people that aren't. I think the more we talk about it, the more we further divide each other. And I, I don't feel that um, I go out on the streets and I, I'm not treated the same way by the homeless because actually they, they make jokes with me, laugh with me. In fact, just two weeks ago, um, there was a native uh, man that came up to me, asked me for change, and he was well and clean cut. I said, jump in my car, I'll, I'll uh, give you a ride home. It was snowing and I can actually vouch for that and have that person come forward. I don't, I don't feel that that is uh, really an issue. I think the more that we make it an issue, the more it becomes an issue. And we're not addressing the real problem, which is that people being a part of the community and doing their part. Thank you. Yes, I believe racism exists and happens in Rapid City. Um, racism in any form is not acceptable and, and uh, should not be tolerated. Thanks. Unfortunately, I know for a fact that it exists, and it exists in the ranks of our, some of our city staff, which needs to be weeded out, and it's unfortunate that I'm not in there to be able to take care of some of these situations that, are, that, that happen, but it also, it also um, isn't vested in, in women also, the, the sexism thing, the racism thing, people look different thing, all these types of things that are, are born out of ignorance or, or whatever. And, and we can have a conversations about them or we can each do something about them like I mentioned to you earlier. As your mayor, I have little tolerance for this, this type of ignorance, especially when you go on to just keep saying, Oh, it wasn't done on purpose. It wasn't done on malice. These types of things are hurtful more so than even the racism that took place in the first place or the sexism or whatever the case may be. So I can tell you from my heart, it does exist. It's unfortunate because sometimes we go through life and we don't think that we experience it because we may not be in that shoes. It's the same thing. I think I had a conversation with the, the fellow up front here and he was explaining to me some of the, the things that they were doing in their campaign. So. I, I do know. Thank you. All right. Who needs Jason? Okay. Racism exists because sin exists. Each and every one of us is a fallen human being. And do I believe there's racism in Rapid City? Yeah. I believe there's a lot of uh, evil and bad things in Rapid City, including racism. Now, the root cause of racism would come down to your heart and who has your heart. And if who has your heart, is aligned the right way with our God, our creator, then you will see people that each and every person has value, worth, and potential. So quite frankly, racism doesn't belong in Rapid City as it doesn't belong in each and every one of us as the image bearers of God. As a man of faith, I would tell you that uh, you cannot love God and hate an, uh, your neighbor who might be of a different race. Uh, that is anti what the Lord teaches. So. Sorry to get preachy on you, but when you're talking about these kind of matters, this isn't government stuff. This is bigger stuff. And I would say, let's look at our hearts. 
We need churches to make sure that we're teaching people about the image of God. We need families to raise kids upright and a community to set the example. Thank Time. you. Okay, did you have a question? We'll take one more question from the audience and then we'll probably need to start winding up. Hi, um, I just, I wasn't gonna say anything tonight. I wasn't gonna ask a question, but you know, I think part of being a leader is being a really good communicator and saying things very intentionally with kindness and purpose. And as I sat here tonight, I heard words like, uh, you know, normal people that don't have disabilities. Well, you made my relatives sound abnormal that do have disabilities. Or singling out a demographic of people who are also my people and, and saying things like, this doesn't exist. So I think as a leader, and as a leader that I've been in my own life, when you talk to people and communicate with people, if you guys, whoever is elected mayor, how are you gonna stay true to that idea of fidelity of leadership, of listening, not hearing to respond, but listening and communicating and saying words with intention and grace? How will you stay true to that and adhere to that? Because tonight, I heard a lot of missteps and I heard a lot of things that I really didn't like. So as a member of this community, I grew here my whole life. Uh, how would you do that for me, for everybody in this community? Not just certain groups, not just certain neighborhoods, not just certain districts, but everybody. Because you all say you want to represent everybody. So how would you stay true to that? What would you do? Jason, we'll go with you first. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think leadership begins with relationships. So if you're surrounding yourself with with people who just only think and look like you, yeah, that might be a challenge. Uh, for me, I have people in my life that hold me accountable. For starters, my wife, if I get out of line, she puts me back in line, right? And I walk the line. But I also have friends and, and people who are allowed to speak into my life that I'm bound to say something wrong. If I'm elected, I can't promise I won't accidentally or even whatever, say the, say the wrong thing. But I, I do have people in my life that'll tell me, hey, you are out of bounds here. You need to get it, you need to course correct. I think leadership is accountability, not just to hold everybody else accountable because I'm a top down leader. You hold yourself accountable and you have others around you that you invite to hold you accountable. And I think that's a significant part of it. And I think the other part of it is listening with respect. Uh, I don't know everything. I don't understand uh, everybody's experience, but I will tell you that that leaders uh, take the opportunity to hear various points of view and they do their, they filter that through their values and try to live that out. I hope to inspire that for our community. Thank you. All right, Laura, you were next. I think you spoke so eloquently. Thank you for that. As a speech language pathologist, I studied the impacts of expressive and receptive language. Words do matter and I think all of us have said the wrong thing at the wrong time at one point in their life. And I think it's important to hold, have people surrounding you that won't be yes people, but they will help you be a better person and help you use better words. I know I'm using better words than when I first got on council in 2017. There were figurative languages, slangs of speech that I never really thought about. And now I understand, so I check myself. In addition, I have two 22-year-olds that truly keep me accountable because um, I want to be the best possible leader for everybody, and I will do that by listening more than talking. Thank you. Josh. <clears throat> I think that comes down to compassion. Really, either you're compassionate or you're not, and I don't think that ever leaves who you are as a person. Um, the way I was raised, uh, and my mother would come by our foster home and she only had $5 to her name and would come up and try to buy my friends a sandwich with their very last penny, you know, and, and it had nothing to do with anything else besides compassion and love for human beings. And I think that's, um, that's what leadership comes down to is to having compassion for, for everybody the ones to your left, to your right, and uh, everybody around you. Thank you. That was a powerful question. I, t um, I guess 
I feel like when I get up in the morning and I look at in the, myself in the mirror, I need to spend a little bit of more time on contemplation and self self assessment as to what I want to try to call, accomplish in a day and uh, and the good I uh, hopefully I can do. And I, and I think I also need to do a better job of listening. So I appreciate the question. I probably didn't answer your question, but uh, it's, uh, w it's a question we needed to hear tonight. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I appreciate the question too because I'm the one that said normal people without disabilities. And the minute I said it, I knew that in the context of, of that, it could be taken incorrectly, but in the context of what I mean from my heart, I guess that's where the trust building comes into place. That where we have two minutes to come up with the answer. It's we're under the gun here. Everybody's staring at us. It doesn't. It's not an excuse, but I can tell you that if you get to know me, you'll see that I don't make any notes. I don't prepare any speeches. I don't do any of that stuff. I'm talking from my heart and what I really mean. I'm not having anything to hide. If you vote for me, this is what you get. And I am going to make mistakes, but I do hold myself very accountable for everything I do. Every morning I get up, I look in the mirror, and I say, what can I do better today? How can I treat someone better today? And I learn something from those things. And I appreciate you're an eloquent speaker. I, I like the way you uh, put your sentences together. That's perfect. Uh, I just want you to say that I will hold myself accountable. That's one thing I am. And I will hold others accountable for the same high standards. All right, I am going to ask the last question. This is a high stakes election and all of you are running vigorous campaigns. Disagreements can become heated. Recently there have been incidents that crossed the line. Now, I am not accusing any of you of any illegal activity. I just want you to be clear about that. But my question is, are each of you willing to ensure that the remainder of the campaign is conducted in a civil manner? All you got to do is say yes or no. Yes. Yes. All right, then. Thank you. What does that mean? What does that mean? They, I, when I say yes, I'm committed to uh, not sending out nasty mailers, not doing negative campaigns, um, no character assassinations. I'm not going to associate myself with any destructive third-party individuals, and I won't be any apart with uh, any attack packs. Are we all agreement in that? I've been in on several of these campaigns, and I hope that you give me a second here. And one thing that I find is these things happen. People get their signs stolen. People say, I mean, if you want to learn how quickly people don't like you, knock on their door. Send them, a, send them a text message. There's no way that we can control what some of you people do. I would say if you're supporting me, be civil. Stick to the facts. I'm a fact-oriented guy. If you want to slam the door in my face, I can take it. You want to call me a name? You want to send me a text? You want to put something on Facebook about me? I'm good with that. But I will not do it to any of my competitors, and I will not... I will not allow people that support me to do that. But I can't help it if they do. And I, I don't want to be held accountable for something somebody does that is not me. So I've been through lots of these. So I, I tease Brad and Jason about having enough of him stealing my signs. Because I got to have fun with this, too. OK, let's move on. So. I, I should have known better than to ask for a yes or no answer. <laughs> I'll mark that in my education log. All right. It's optional whether you want to say anything more about this question. Um, no, I agree with them all. I, I think nine out of ten of my signs have been taken down or stolen or, you know. Uh, and, and the whole idea is just to get the information out to the people, you know. I mean, it's it's as simple as that. We just, we just want to provide information and let everybody know what their stance is so we you can make the best decision what's best for our community. It's expensive and it's tough. It's you know it's tough and it's expensive and signs cost a lot of money. But I will tell you that Ron's signs, if you buy the chicken feeders at Menards, his signs fit perfectly on the bottom of them. So that does, yeah. You know, not not that I knew firsthand. I just heard about it. Well, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. 
Okay, any other? Jason, I guess you need a comment. <laughs> I will just say long before I ever decided to run, uh, I made a commitment to the good Lord, to my family and my friends that we would win the right way. And I surrounded myself with people who agree with that. And so that is what I'm committed to. Thank you. With that, I would like to say, oh, I wanted to allow some time, so if you want to individually talk to one of the candidates, we have a, f a little bit of time to do that. And there's also information out there on the tables if you're interested. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, this is what you're like 110th mayoral candidate forum, something like that. We really appreciate the time that you uh, gave to us to uh, answer these questions. And I, my apologies to those people who submitted questions that we did not get to, but we've just run out of time, so I'm very sorry about that. Okay. That's it. <laughs>